Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing great. And uh, I'm so pleased to be on this call and uh, to be introducing some of you to John McKnight. But really, does John McKnight need any introduction? Probably the most famous community developer uh, in North America today. And he's been that way for over 30 years. John is a founder and co-director of Asset-Based Community Development Institute whose graduates include both Michelle and Barack Obama. He, con he continues to have an impact strengthening communities and neighborhoods around the world. In 2013, John was awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Waterloo in recognition of his innovative work. And I was so pleased to be able to be there with John and on behalf of the university, um, introduce John uh, for that doctorate. For three decades, John had researched social service delivery systems, health policy, community organizations, and neighborhood policy. He is the author of The Careless Society and co-author of Building Communities from the Inside Out and the, with Peter Block, The Abundant Community. John serves on the boards of several national organizations that support neighborhood development, and he remains tireless in his recognition and champion championing of citizens and their capacity to care for one another as an essential resource in the work of building better communities and neighborhoods. Welcome, John, and thank you for joining us on today's broadcast. Thanks, Paul. <clears throat> so, I appreciate the kind introduction. You know, I always love it uh, when I'm talking with people in Canada. In fact, when I'm in Canada, I think I've spent in the last 30 years or so, quarter of my time in Canada, because uh, across the country, people there seem to me to be uh, especially interested in an asset-based approach. And I've uh, concluded that a part of that interest is the fact that I think Canada has a much more cooperative culture and we have in the United States where I think competition tends to be uh, the rule uh, more often than, than cooperation. So it's, it's great to be able to join you. We're going to try to focus on neighborhoods uh, this morning. The general topic we have is about communities, but I'm thinking uh, here that we're going to focus on communities in a particular space. And, uh, you know, I spent about half of uh, my working life in uh, neighborhoods and neighborhood organizing, and then I went into a university. And they're very different kinds of uh, places. They have different languages and cultures. And one of the things I noticed as I would bounce back between the university and the neighborhoods is that the way people know is different. People know in a university by studies, but people know in a neighborhood by stories. And so in the asset-based world, stories are very, very important because it's, uh, it's our local way of knowing. A story that uh, I think uh, is very informative for me is one that uh, happened some years ago. I was visiting the west coast uh, of Ireland, and uh, we were staying in a little village, probably had a, a church, one store, and uh, 15 uh, houses. And uh, outside, of, uh, outside of the town, there was a lake, and I loved the fish. I always carry a rod and reel with me. But I didn't have any bait. <clears throat> So I decided to go to the little store and see if they had any bait there. And uh, I walked up the path to the store, and the door was open, and inside was an older man. And I said to him, do you, uh, sir, do you, do you sell bait here? And he said to me, well, what do you mean bait? And I said, well, like worms. And he, he was silent for quite some time. And then he said to me, uh, turn around, Sonny, will you? And uh, I was looking out the door, and he says, you see the path here up to the store? You see there are those big whitewashed stones on either side of the path? 
Well, he said, you know, if you just go out there and turn over that stone or any of those stones, I'm sure you'll find all the worms that you need. And I always remembered that because it showed how I had thought <laughs> that I had to go and buy something from someplace else when all around me was what I wanted, right? but it was invisible to me. And so I think that what we have often is a parallel in terms of thinking about neighborhoods. Uh, there are visible parts of a neighborhood that some people see, but then there are invisible parts. And most often what's invisible is what's there. So that an asset-based approach is, in one sense, making visible what is invisible in a neighborhood. Now, if you think about a neighborhood, you could think about a, a, a glass that had uh, water filled to the middle of the glass. And it's, so it's half empty and it's half full. And uh, what I think happens is that like neighborhoods that are half empty and half full, and like individuals who are half empty and half full, that most of us who come from an institutional setting look at the neighborhood and see the empty half rather than the full half, rather than what's there. We don't see that, <laughs> that if we turn the stone over, what we're looking for is right there. Why is that, I wonder? And I think it is because most of us in institutions have functions, uh, and those functions usually have to do with meeting needs. Uh, we need clients and we need consumers in order for our institution to work. And uh, as a result of focusing on this function of meeting needs, we see in the neighborhood what isn't there rather than what is there. And so the result of that is that the kind of map that we usually have of a neighborhood, especially older neighborhoods or small towns that may be thought of as being trouble, is a needs map. Can we see that needs map? So this is the way a neighborhood might look if you saw its empty half. And when I came to the university, I realized that almost all the research that was being done about neighborhoods uh, in almost all universities and in policy centers was about the deficits, the empty half, the needs. But I had spent a good many years organizing in neighborhoods, and I knew that this needs map only represented half of the picture. And that what we also had in the neighborhood was uh, resources that were not visible on this map. So we decided uh, that it would be a good thing, we being at the, uh, the asset-based group at Northwestern University, if we would begin to do a study of what was there rather than what wasn't there. And uh, we went to uh, about uh, 20 cities, 300 neighborhoods, and uh, we asked people just knocking on doors. We didn't ask leaders. We asked uh, residents this question, which is a, a magical question. It works so well. We had a lot of questions we used that didn't work well. But uh, the one that works is, what have people who live here done together to make things better? What have people who live here done together that makes things better? And we asked that in uh, two Canadian cities and 18 U.S. cities and collected about 3,000 answers to that question from local people. Uh, we then analyzed uh, all those stories. And we asked of the stories, what is it that people used when they made things better? 
Uh, and we ask that in particular because most of these neighborhoods from a policy or agency or institutional position, most of these neighborhoods were looked at as needy. And yet we were able to identify the ingredients or the building blocks that were used when things there, or people there made things better. And so we were able to have a, an asset map rather than just a needs map. And uh, can you show the asset map? And there you can see that there are a lot of resources. We tended to call them assets because an asset starts small and if you invest it correctly, it grows large. And that's what these building blocks uh, or basic ingredients that we found in the stories uh, are. So looking at all those stories, no matter what they were about, we saw that there were six basic resources or ingredients or building blocks or assets that appeared over and over again, that no matter what the story was about, they were, people were drawing from six assets. And these assets were not all used at once. You might use uh, asset one and asset four. So uh, we, we had uh, developed then the, uh, the information about these six assets, and we uh, published a book which is called Building Communities from the Inside Out, which is the basic guide to identifying and mobilizing those assets. We'll mention it again at the end. But uh, the book uh, has become, I think, the best-selling uh, community development book in North America. Uh, it sold about 125,000 copies by now. And uh, one might wonder why has this idea of these six assets in the neighborhood been uh, so popular or useful? And I think it is because it's simple, useful, and universal. So let me remind you briefly what these six assets are. Every one of us on this uh, webinar is raised in a neighborhood. So I'm not going to tell you something you don't know, but I am going to try to lift the rock and help us all see what those uh, assets are. And uh, I want to focus on the first three more than the second three because the first three are the human assets. So next slide. Uh, the first asset is individuals. And as you can see, the individual is holding a gift. Uh, it, it, it's an individual who has something to offer, some capacity, some skills. And in every story, all, all 3,000 stories, the flower in the cake, the one ingredient that appeared to everyone is the individuals and their capacities, not their needs. Every one of the people had needs, but you can't do anything with a need. Let me tell you a story that helped me understand this. I belonged uh, in the university to a faculty. We had 17 members of the faculty. Uh, the department I was in was rated the first or second best in the United States year after year. and. Uh, so if I go to a faculty meeting, uh, I'm there. And you know, I have a bad heart. I've had a uh, bypass operation. Uh, so I've got a, a real deficit, a real empty part of myself. And also at the faculty meeting, sitting next to me was uh, Paul. Paul had an operation on cancer, it didn't work. And Paul's dying. And next to him was a woman named Mary, and uh, she got a divorce, divorce uh, this year. Her children decided to go with her husband rather than her. Her family is falling apart. Next to her was a guy named Charles. Uh, they, he's crazy. You know, he's a madman. 
but he's the best scholar of British rhetoric in in the world. And so those are the first four members of our faculty. And I could go around to all the other 13 of them and describe them in terms of their empty half or their deficits. But in fact, you would wonder why is it that this is uh, perhaps the best faculty of its kind in the United States with all these screwed up, troubled, deficit <laughs> laden people? We're a mess, but we are the best. And the reason is because we ignore our deficits and we focus on our assets and we put them together. And that's what makes an association of effectiveness. Now, this is true every place. Anybody who's uh, with us today knows that anything that ever got built used the capacities of local people or any people and ignored their deficits. So it's very peculiar that when we went to the university, all they knew about was deficits because you can't build anything from them. In fact, they can mislead you if you think they are the important resource. So the first asset is the gifts and the capacities of individuals like our faculty members and not their deficits. And uh, we have a website, uh, which we'll mention at the end, and uh, there are all kinds of tools there that will help identify and uh, mobilize the capacities of individuals. Uh, next slide. The second asset is what we call associations, smaller groups. Uh, and uh, if you show the, the next slide, this is a definition. They are usually uh, small groups. Uh, the members do the work. They're not paid. And they create a vision and are the principal producers of that, uh, of that vision. There are all kinds of associations, but we often confuse associations with uh, not-for-profit institutions. They may be, but most aren't. So next slide shows you the kinds of associations that are in neighborhoods. And uh, as you can see, there are a great variety of them with different purposes. And I show the next slide, and you'll see some more examples of associations. The thing that we know about associations is that they are the way the gifts of individuals get put together in a group so that each individual's gift gets magnified. Think of somebody who has a good voice and they join a choir and the choir magnifies greatly the uh, the voice of each person within it. That's what associations do. They are our great empowerment tools in a democracy. The other thing that we know about associations, and we can talk about this if anybody wants to raise the question, they are, in North America, the center of our democracy. And therefore, the focus on associations has always been critical for us, and our website shows all kinds of tools for the identification and the mobilization of local associations. Now, the third asset is groups of people who come together in the neighborhood, and unlike people in associations, they're paid. People in associations are not paid, but if we have the, next, if we have the slide that shows the organization chart, People in these forms in the neighborhood, these groups in the neighborhood, are paid. So there is that very significant difference between a voluntary association and a paid institution, and that makes the difference. We talk at my university, we say, well, we're a community of scholars at our university. But if uh, they stop paying us, uh, we're not going to be a community long, I can, I can assure you. We'll move on. 
so that the glue that holds associations together is trust and care, and the glue that holds institutions together is finally money. So there are two forms that are very different in the very basis that makes them work. I think that one of the problems that we see in terms of failed neighborhood initiatives is that people don't recognize that an association, a circle of people who know each other, is very different than an institution, and each of them performs different functions. Let me say it again, it's so important. An association has certain functions that it's good at, and an institution has certain functions that it's good at. And most failed neighborhood activities, we think, from looking at the stories, is when institutions try to do what only associations can do. In fact, they not only try, they force associations and community citizen life out of the picture. So I think it's helpful and uh, in, uh, in training people about ABCD, we often show them the geometry lesson. The next slide uh, that has a, a triangle and a circle at the top. This is a way of trying to explain the difference between an institution and an association and the associational world of, of citizens. They are two tools, very different. They're like a hammer and a saw. Each is good if you use it for the right thing, but if you try to cut a board in half with a hammer, then you'll fail. And that's, uh, that's why we have some failed neighborhood efforts. So let's look down the, the left-hand column so you're clear about the functions of institutions. The first thing is we went over to the Graduate School of Management and we asked them, a couple of faculty members, why do you organize people in this triangular shape? And uh, they responded to us, incidentally, they, they all have the same idea, so it's not in much dispute. It's, it's the way you would organize people if you want to have a few people control a lot of other people. So if you want to control people, this is a good mechanism. Now, why would you want to control people? Well, it's a perfectly good reason, because you want to produce things but you want to produce things that have standards and that you uh, and uniformity. This form developed out of mass production. It allows you to produce a lot of the same thing. And the kinds of things that we tend to talk about being produced are goods and services. Now, if we produce a lot more of the same thing, what we need is clients or consumers so that our focus on, on people is as clients or consumers, and we could focus on their capacities, but for most of us, we tend to think what we're, fo what we're doing is have, uh, filling the blank part of people. I, at a university, you know, I needed 18-year-olds who people thought were incomplete, were still empty, so that I could fill them. Because if we, we thought they were filled up at 18, I'd be out of a job. I needed their, their deficit. I needed clients and consumers. And so what I... I then focus on is needs, and this is why needs maps tend to be very common. Now, in the associational world, what we have is not control, but choice. People are there not because they're going to get money, but because of two things. They care about each other, or they care about the same thing. And so, Instead of producing service, what they are are organizations that 
are held together and are the manifestation of what people care about. And institutions can't do that. An institution, I'm sorry to say, can't care. Care is the commitment of one to another from the heart. And so in the United States, we have something called Medicare. The government runs it. And Medicare doesn't care. It can't care. It's a bunch of people in a large institution who send out checks to doctors and, and sometimes to patients. So one of the things that's happened over the last two decades is more and more we, we act as though institutions are the place where care is provided. We talk about care providers, right? And I don't think there are any institutions that are care providers. The center of care is associational life. Now, let me make clear as well that there are individuals in any institution who can care. But the institution cannot substitute for the kind of personal care that powers a local association. So in a neighborhood where you're focused on associational life, then what you need is not clients, but you need citizens. That is, a citizen is someone who has the possibility to join with others and create a vision and then make it come true to be its principal producer. And therefore, what we need in the associational world is the capacities of people rather than their needs. So these are the two very different kinds of functions. And let me make clear that uh, we're not being negative about the institutions. Uh, I fly a lot in an airplane, and I never want an airplane run by an association. I don't want the pilot up there to say, okay, folks, we're all here. Let's get together and uh, decide where we're going to go. I want somebody in control and I'm at the bottom of the <laughs> of the chart on the other hand if I want to develop a set of caring relationships I think of a wonderful organization called La Leche League which is a, 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 an association there are thousands and thousands of them all over where women get together and and care about their infants, care about breastfeeding, and it's been a, a wonderful uh, health movement, and I think probably movement in terms of, of child raising all across the world. So I don't think there's an institution that can produce what eight women in, in a uh, uh, La Leche League be can, and the La Leche League people can't fly an airplane. So the real question for us in terms of looking at local neighborhoods is what is it that is there and how can it be connected in such a way that we get the, the producer being principally the local citizenry and their associational activity. Now, we have a, a, a workbook that I'll mention at the end called Discovering Community Power that is focused on, uh, on that kind of uh, approach. How, how, would you, how would you analyze an activity in a way that would assure that the local assets are used to produce the result? Now, uh, I, those are the three main assets, the gifts of individuals, the associations they create, and the institutions that can support them. The other three assets, I'm just going to say quickly because we don't really have time to go into them. The, the fourth asset is the physical space in a neighborhood. And it, it is an asset, both the land, everything on top of it, and anything that may be of value underneath it. And that space appears as an asset in stories. The fifth asset is exchange. People are in these stories constantly sharing, giving, trading, bartering, 
uh, buying, selling, exchanging. And all of those modes we call exchange because they are the interactive connection that goes on between the various assets. And the last asset is stories. We started with that because stories are the principal way that people know in a local place and they capture history and create culture. If you look at our website, you'll see a lot of materials that may be helpful in terms of the identification of those assets. So in summary, let me say that uh, now we should have a slide that up that says the basic ABCD findings. <laughs> um, there are three findings from looking at all these stories that are important. And the first is that there are assets in every neighborhood and you can't do anything productive if you don't know what they are. And so this, this guide that we have helping you see what they are is, uh, I think, a, a very useful thing. The second thing is that every story is about assets that were not connected becoming connected. So that rather than leadership, we think connectorship is probably the most important kind of activity at the local level. How do things get connected is a focus that ABCD tends to bring to the, to the thought process. And the third is, if you know the assets that are there and you know they need to be connected, you need to have some institution, association, or individual that will do something that will begin the connective process. And uh, so if we look at the next slide, we've done a lot of studies about connectors and what are they like. And uh, here's a summary of what we think are the attributes of uh, many of the best uh, connectors in a neighborhood. And the first is they are gift-centered. They're not the kind of people who go to City Hall and tell how bad things are in the neighborhood in, in order to get a grant. And the second thing is they're well connected. They know about the gifts of local individuals and they know about a lot of clubs, groups, and associations, and they know about the people who are key in the local institutions. The third is that they are trusted because the associational world is held together by trust. And finally, they believe their community is welcoming and that, that it is not exclusive they see that welcoming the stranger is a way of strengthening any community. Uh, finally, next slide, it says three planning questions. When you think about a neighborhood moving to a larger scale where the neighborhood has a vision for what it wants to achieve, let's say the vision as 10 things they want to achieve, then there are three questions about that vision. And it's critical, absolutely critical, that the questions be asked in this order. What can we achieve by using our own assets? We've got six assets. We want to do these 10 things. How many of them can we do with the assets we have? And let's say in this case, we can do, uh, do Five of them we can do with what we have. Second question is, what could we do with what we have if we had some support from the outside, from institutions that are outside? And there, let's say that we get that kind of support that in that kind of, uh, of activity, we have, uh, let's say, three, three of the ten. Uh, we can we can do if we uh, put our assets together with some outside support. That means there are two left, and the two left are what only outside resources or institutions can provide. We can't do it by ourselves, and we can't do it 
in combination with outside institutions. So when we start this process, we are going to end up with citizens being at the center and institutions being in support. But when you start the other way around and you ask, what can't we do with our assets in any neighborhood, in any city, in any town, what you find is there are all kinds of institutions who can think up a number, a myriad of things <laughs> that people can't do by themselves. And so the focus starting there ends up with a, with a needs map where institutions are the providers of what people are purported to need. So I think the key finally for us is who's producing the result of this uh, uh, neighborhood activity. And if the neighbors are the principal producers, then we know that the center of democracy, the process that is absolutely responsive because it is defined and executed by the people who know what they need, becomes the way we operate. We always start from the inside out. Uh, I think the next uh, slide is, uh, shows uh, some publications, uh, two. One is the, the book Building Communities from the Inside Out that goes over the assets in detail, a lot of stories, a lot of examples, a lot of tools. And the other is Discovering Community Power, and that's a, a guide for anybody who, we did this for, for the Kellogg Foundation, a really big foundation, who wanted to evaluate every proposal they got in terms of whether or not citizens were being utilized and strengthened as a result of the initiative. If it was about health or economy, whatever it was about with citizens being used, mobilized, and in control of the first question, what can we do with what we have? So I think those two publications are especially useful. Let me say in conclusion that uh, the ABCD Institute is physically located today at DePaul University in Chicago, but it is basically a group of 32 people practitioners around the country who are exemplars and who do training for us. Uh, and that training usually involves two kinds of things. Number one, how can an institution support or precipitate citizens being productive? And second, how can local neighborhoods and their associations identify and mobilize their assets? We have 32 of these faculty members, and uh, if any of you are interested, you can go to our website and you can see who the faculty members are. And uh, they are excellent resources in trying to see how can we become more powerful in having citizens being the principal producers of the future. So Paul, I think that's uh, the the basic groundwork for understanding what an asset-based approach is. Hi, John. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think if all of us could give you a round of applause, uh, we would be doing it at this point. <laughs> you know what strikes me, John, is that every time, I must have heard this presentation 20 times, and I'm sure more. <laughs> and every time I hear it, I am mesmerized. I am compelled. And I, I don't quite know why because it's so logical. It makes so much sense. And I just wonder sometimes why we complicated service yeah. delivery the way that we have. Huh? Right. So it's, um, you know, the, 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 the joy of ABCD is that it resonates so quickly with so many people. And we recognize, I think, in what you're saying, how we want to be treated. And if we're part of a system, we want that system to give us choice. 
We want that system to engage with us. We don't want to serve the system. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and and we understand why when we serve the system, it it doesn't just dehumanize us. It um it disempowers us. It 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 in many ways one would say it kills the energy um, that is inherent within um, a community. So I, I'm so aware of this. And, and I know, John, you know, in Canada, ABCD is evolving quickly. I mean, I know that there are Alan Mansky and myself, we are both ABCD fellows here in Canada. And then we've got folks at the Cody Institute as well um, that are very organized. But there are also hundreds of people who've been exposed, if not thousands of people exposed to this work and who use this approach um, in their work. And, and for those of you who have not yet been there, um, go to the website at ABCD Canada. Uh, and we've been working with John to disseminate the knowledge and the, the good news of ABCD, I guess, um, in Canada. And um, I know Heather will be announcing later on, uh, but I'm so excited to talk about it because John is going to be there, Cormac Russell is going to be there, um, and it's a, a gathering of everybody who loves ABCD. It's going to be in Kitchener, Ontario, which is just outside of Toronto. Uh, on April 17 to 19. Um, so put that in your calendar, April 17 to 19, in the ABCD Canada gathering. Again, John will be there and he'll be teaching with us and Cormac Russell, who I often call the younger version of John McKnight. <laughs> with an John, Irish brogue. <laughs> a strong, strong mentor of Cormac, and he comes out of England. He'll be there as well. And um, and there will be many others as, a, as it unfolds. So we'll be sending you more information shortly um, about that. John, so when we talk about the work of ABCD, and we, by the way, we're gonna have, have time for your questions as well. And so please send them to us via the chat box uh, within GoToMeeting and Heather will read them out um, and we'll be able to, um, uh, talk with you and get John to answer them correct uh, uh, specifically. So please put your questions in, um, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll be with you in just a moment. John, give me a sense of uh, ABCD uh, living out in a neighborhood. Um, specifically, maybe tell the story of asset mapping and um, and the practical tool that that is. Um, I know that you talked about assets in your presentation, but there's all kinds of practical tools here that help us make this real. Yeah, I think uh, maybe a story uh, that you find locally would, uh, would manifest uh, what you're, you're looking for. Uh, I remember knocking on the door <clears throat> in a neighborhood in Chicago, uh, and a woman came to the door and I raised the question. I said, can you tell us what people here have done together that made things better? And uh, she said, uh, well, she says, you know, uh, two years ago, my daughter became a teenager. And during the summer vacation, she was running around with the girl next door. And I thought they were probably starting to move down the wrong path. And I had to do something about that. So I thought, well, what would we do if, uh, if, if, if we figured out what our daughters ought to do? And she said, I sat down with the woman next door, and we thought up about uh, 10 things that they could do. But we didn't think we could carry off getting all those done during the summer. So we knew that there were eight other women on the block, and we invited them together. They had a potluck. And... Uh, they presented the 10 things they thought of, and these women on the block added a lot of other things that could be done, and then they organized themselves so that when the summer came, that they were able to uh, uh, supervise getting the things done that they had in mind, 
and they worked with the local park that was a block away and uh, got the park manager to give them a place to meet in the park building every every morning uh, or when they wanted to have a meeting uh, because there were too many uh, girls now involved to to, uh, um, to do it in a home and so I asked her well what kinds of things did you do and she said well we did a couple of different things we would take the girls to some place uh, at least once or twice a week that they hadn't been before. We'd take them to an insurance company, and the insurance company was willing to sit down at their headquarters, talk with us about what is insurance, why you need it. But she said more important, they saw who was working in the insurance company, and they saw that there were there young women who were working in that in that business and so we did that all summer and the result was they learned all kinds of things about the world that they needed to learn but they also had all kinds of openings in their mind as to where vocation might be manifested and uh, <coughs> pardon me the second thing she said we did was we have a lot of artistic people in the neighborhood so we got them to come in sometimes for a day and sort of introduce the girls to their form of art. And the result of that is we have four girls who are going on to school focusing on art. And the other thing we did was we asked all the girls to come to, as they came together to figure out a project they could do together to make the neighborhood better. And they decided to have <clears throat> Every neighbor develop a flag, and they uh, they asked the neighbors to draw symbols that could be on a flag that represented their family and its nature and history, and they then sewed these symbols uh, onto flags, and they had a flag day in which every house uh, put up their flag, and people moved from house to house to learn about what that flag meant and really to learn about who was really there in the neighborhood. And she then said, you know, one of the things that this has taught me is that I'm telling you things we did, but we're a real community now because mm -hmm. we broke the lines. The, the girls are connected, the mothers are connected, the girls and the mothers are connected so that we have a whole relationship that we can build on now. We can do all kinds of things we couldn't do before because of the connections. And I thought what she's telling me about is how the gift of one individual who had, who, who had the creativity to think about what she could do to make her daughter's life better in the summer created an association of women and connected with an institution called the Park District. And all of it was there. And when they were done with that summer, they had, with what they had, created an incredible community that has been able to go on and on and do all kinds of other things, both in celebration and in learning and in advocacy. So I don't know whether that's what you were asking for, but that's the story. Wow, that's actually a lot more than I was asking for. It's beautiful. Um, and what a lovely uh, example. John, I, I just want to say thank you so much uh, for being with us today. I'm going to pass it over to Heather now. Um, she has some closing slides and... Uh, and just some announcements for everybody on this call today. But just so you know, um, when you're on this call today, this is the first of a four-part series. Uh, we're going to be having, uh, over the next four months, uh, different significant key people talk with us about asset-based community development. We want to talk about neighbors. We want to talk about health. Uh, we want to talk about um, some of the cutting-edge thinking and practical uses for asset-based community development, which is relevant today more than it has ever been. 
But before Heather gets on this uh, call for those announcements, John, just a huge thank you to you, not only for the call today, but for being a mentor and a friend and for inspiring the work of the Tamarack Institute. Thank you so much. Well, and thank you. We've learned as much in Canada as any place else, and it's been wonderful to, to be a learner in Canada over the, all these years. Thank you, John. Heather? Um, I am just wondering, John, if you could, in a very short way, we have two, we have a lot of questions come in, and um, I'm going to make a promise to those who did the questions, I will theme them, and we will try to see if we can answer or provide uh, resources to your questions. But John, there's two that came in that if you could just briefly talk about, um, and they're around doing the asset-based community development work in, in, in Indigenous communities. Um, and so if you have an example or is it is does it work differently? Uh, <clears throat> I think that indigenous communities uh, have a structure that is is different often than uh, European communities, and that these communities see themselves. Uh, the way I think most European communities don't. They see the individual and the, the clan or the tribe as the center, and then outside are the other kinds of institutions which may be viewed negatively or positively. I think in uh, European communities, we tend to think that we're surrounded by institutions that provide us with the good life and that that indigenous communities understand that it's inside out that makes uh, a traditional good life and uh, and what we're trying to do in European communities through ABCD is is to help people see what I think most indigenous people see about the center being individuals and their group and groups rather than a bunch of institutions that make you clients. Great, thank you. And then the other question, there's quite a few questions around doing this work in a rural setting versus the city setting and is there a difference? Uh, now, we have uh, generally focused on cities, and it's only been in recent years that more and more local uh, neighborhoods, I mean towns, small towns, uh, have begun to say, oh, we're using this, this approach as well. I don't know that uh, there's anything uh, distinctive about either the asset base or the methodology between cities and rural areas. I do think, however, that in rural areas, if they're small enough, that people do tend to know each other in terms of their capacities more than is likely to be true in uh, urban areas. So I think there's always a head start for that reason, that people really do see each other in terms of their various abilities and capacities much more often than they would in cities. I, you know what? I tend to agree. I live in a small community, and I know everybody in the street. And you're walking That's down, it. and who they are, and so um, I agree. Thank you, John. Um, like I said, I'm going to theme the questions that came in in a post email. We'll provide resources and tools and stuff to help answer the questions. Um, we're going to go on to the next slide, which talks about the deepening communities, and I'm going to use this opportunity to plug myself. Um, I am new in this position, and um, I am here for you. If you have any questions or comments or um, in need of resources or tools, please reach out to me. It's heather at tamrackcommunity.ca, and if I don't know the answer, I will find the answer for you. Um, the next slide, I'm going to go briefly because everything's on the slide, and you're going to be getting these slides afterwards because I want to respect the time. Um, please save the date uh, for the ABCD uh, workshop. It is awesome. Uh, you will learn so much, meet so many people doing the same kind of work. 
uh, you'll be able to hear lessons learned and um, maybe get some new relationships and friendships. So save a date, more information will come. I will make sure you get that information um, as it comes. The next slide is we have a webinar coming up, 211, a tool for alleviating poverty. Um, you can go to our website and register for that webinar. And lastly, we will be sending you a post email. Like I said, with the answers to your questions, resources and tools, you will receive the slide deck and um, the recording from today. And I would love for you to reach out to me in, about this webinar, what you liked, what you didn't like, so that we can improve for next time. So it is now one o'clock. Um, have a great afternoon and until next time. Thank you.